20 years ago, I was in London with Reuters giving a talk at the, at the old uh, London Stock Exchange. And uh, most of the people there were in three-piece suits. I guess they'd just come from work, and I told a joke. I always like to open with a little humor and thinking, well, in England, you know, they have the same humor as Americans. Nobody laughed. Yeah, Nobody even well. smiled. And I thought, oh, boy. And I'll tell you, it's hard to get going after that. So, so I, don't, I don't tell any jokes anymore. Uh, I, I do have a bunch of grandkids now. My grandson said, Grandpa, how old are you? And I said, 66. And he said, Grandpa, did you start at one? <laughs> anyway, I've done a lot of things. You don't need to read that. Uh, these are the books I've written. This, this is... This is my pride and joy. I put 40 years of being a technical analyst into this. Uh, just, a, just I don't, I didn't hold any punches. Uh, I'm sure I've alienated a few people in modern finance, and I've uh, also talked about some of the things in technical analysis that I kind of challenge. And I'm going to do that at the end today if there's still anybody left. Uh, so I'd just like to say that I've got, I've got strong opinions on a lot of things, but I will, I will say this. Technical analysis is an art form. It doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong. It's not a science. So if I speak absolutely, that doesn't mean that I expect you to accept it as absolute. Fair enough. Um, I guess in a lot of analysis, this is... I, just, I made this up. Uh, Thank God for that. <laughs> yes, yes. And I get, I get asked, uh, Mr. Morris, what do you think of my analysis? And I said, you're just playing with your software, what you're doing. This is not analysis at all. I see a lot of this. Um, requires no explanation. You have to look at it a minute. So, we're going to talk about fictions and flaws in modern finance. Uh, we'll talk about a rules-based trend-following model, and then we'll talk about some of the TA concepts I was telling you about, and, and the difference between actual and observable information. Uh, a lot of things we learned when we were young, as you can tell, I didn't uh, adjust this for the United Kingdom. Uh, most of you know who George Washington is. Uh, there's an old story when we were young we, that George cut down a cherry tree his father said, George, did you cut down the tree? And he says, Father, I cannot tell a lie. Yes, I did. It was so that you teach your kids to tell the truth. President, first president, general of the Continental Army, couldn't tell a lie. It's a great little story. The problem is it isn't true. It was made up in the 1800s by a guy writing a story about George Washington. Uh, shortest day of the year. Uh, a lot of people think it's December 20. This is the engineer in me coming out, so bear with me. Thinks it's <coughs> December 21st, but that's actually just the shortest period of daylight. It's actually the longest astronomical day because we are the furthest. We're now furthest from the sun than we are on December 21st. So it's something to look up. Uh, where was the Battle of Bunker Hill fought? Uh, that's not unfair with this audience, but it was, it was fought at Breed's Hill, Massachusetts. So. We've learned a lot of things that we accepted as fact when we were young. We didn't challenge them, we didn't question them. So my question to you is how many things in the markets have you accepted as fact without investigating and checking them? So if you believe one of these truths, you probably affect, you, there's probably some other things that you've accepted as fact. Uh, buy and hold is the only way to be successful in the market. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these. Dollar cost averaging. Diversification will protect you from bear markets. Compounding, the eighth wonder of the world. I think Einstein is attributed with saying that he left out a, an adjective. Positive compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. <coughs> You start throwing in some negative years and it doesn't work very well. Uh, probability and risk are the same. That's one of the problems with modern finance, I think. Uh, economists are good at predicting the stock market. The index of leading indicators is a component. The stock market is a component of that. It seems like the cart and the horse are being reversed here. 
And chasing performance is a good technique. Most of these things are pretty obvious. So, I, kind of the short-term strategy goals, uh, and this is for, this is me talking for how I do things. Ignore the short-term mode. Focus on capital appreciation. Try to participate in the up markets if you're long only, which I am, and try to avoid the down markets. Uh, get the human emotion out of the process. This distance between here doesn't work in golf or investing. Uh, sometimes it's more about the ride than the destination. In other words, how your portfolio goes from A to B. It can go like this, or it can go like this. But most people won't be able to stick with that ride. Modern finance uh, started out with some, I think, some very loose assumptions. Uh, investors are rational. The markets are efficient. I think the markets do have an efficiency with them, but it's very hard to capitalize on that efficiency. It's hard to measure it. Uh, they, th they think that risk is the volatility as determined by standard deviation. Of course, when you talk about standard deviation, and Gaussian statistics, then you're making the assumption that that is random. I don't think stock market prices are random. So there's some real problems there. But I'll tell you what, I think, I think what risk is is drawdown. In other words, how much the market has gone down or your portfolio from a new all-time high. You can see this is the Dow Industrial back to about 1950. Uh, this is the percentage of drawdown. That's minus uh, 20 percent, minus 35. Minus 50, and I don't know what that is there. This is probably 1950. That's probably, I can't see it. What's it say? <laughs> it's a lot. Of, yeah. So, and it's, so it's, not, it's not only the magnitude the prices have gone down, it's the time from here to here. There's a, there's a technical end out indicator out there, Peter Martin created called the Holster Index, that is measuring not only the magnitude, but the duration, the amount of time that it takes to get back to even, and getting back to even is not a strategy. This, is, this takes out 1929, so you can see it up more current. So I, I, I think <coughs> loss of capital is what risk is. And I think if you have clients and, and you, they open their January statement and it says that the standard deviation was 0.65 and you lost 32% last year, I think they're gonna call and ask you about it loss of 32 percent when I'm going to ask about standard deviation. Uh, bear markets are drawdowns of greater than 20 percent. I don't know who termed that. I think uh, maybe Bob Stovall, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's a measurement that's accepted. So anything, any drawdown of greater than 20 percent is determined, is, is called a bear market. And you can see the down back to 1885, uh, there were 15 bear markets. And I, went, I did a lot of analysis on, on the, not only the percentage of drawdown, but the peak, the trough dates, the date of recovery, the amount of time it spent going down in the decline, the amount of time it took to recover, the recoveries are always slower than the declines, and then the total duration. Uh, and you can see they're ranked by, and then also the amount, the equivalent return it's called, that it takes to get back to even. 41.8% decline requires a 72% gain to break even. That was the average here for all 15 of these. 71, 72% return. It's, uh, there's a lot of people I haven't seen that in a long time. Uh, I mean, you, you may have, but it's, it doesn't come easy to make 72% return. It takes a long time. So this, is, this is kind of just shows the duration part of the drawdowns. These are all the bear markets here, 20%, the number of days that it took, the number of months, and then the percentage of time. And the reason I show this, I was asked a long time ago, uh, I wasn't asked, I, I heard a lot of people say the market's up, goes up 30% of the time, and I thought, you know, I don't think that's right. I don't know what it is, and so I calculated it. And so, the Dow Industrial Average for however many days, that's 35,000 days worth of data. It spent 96.27% of its time in a state of drawdown. In other words, it had been higher and now it's lower. 
in all those days that it was lower until it made new highs, uh, was this in what's called a state of drawdown. In other words, the Dow Industrials on a daily basis made new all-time highs less than 4% of the time. Now that surprised me. I would have guessed 10 or 12%, just guessing. S&P is a little higher. Now if you do this in the world of finance on monthly data, it's up around 12%. And this is the engineer where I just calculated it backwards, <coughs> measuring the, the number of days that made all-time highs. These bars here, and then you just count them and look at the ratio, and it came up with the same number. So. This is a chart put out by Roger Gibson. He was a Yale professor of 75. This is in a lot of uh, sales brochures and marketing brochures that want you to buy and hold or buy an index fund. And they say, look, Large caps were up 10% a year. Small caps were up 12% a year for the last 85 years. And this would be true. But what, what's wrong with this? Do you have 85 years to invest in? I don't. Don't think. Nobody has. It's an unrealistic piece of data. There's a lot of, I think most people have 20 years on average to really sock it away for retirement, maybe 25. Everybody's different. So there are many 20-year periods in this 85-year 80, sample that didn't do very well at all. So make sure you're looking at data that's representative of your investment horizon. Uh, speaking of average, this is all the 10-year returns back from 1900 on the, what is that, the S&P. A rolling return is from like 1900 to 1909. 1901 to 1910, 19, like that. So there's rolling 10 year returns. And remember those two, the small cap and large cap, and the last one, they were 10 and 12 percent. So here's the 8 to 12 percent of the, so it was only, it was only average 22 percent of the time. Average is a horribly misused term in modern finance. It's kind of like the six foot tall Texan that drowned while wading across a stream that averaged only three feet deep. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. This is a little more engineering with me. Talks about harmonic mean. We'll just we can come back to this later. While everybody's still here, I don't want to get into this. Uh, here's a chart of the the annual returns on Dow Industrials. The red are the down years. The green are the up years. And if I were up here selling you a buy and hold strategy or an index fund, I'd say. I'd say, look, the market's up two-thirds of the time. <coughs> and it would be correct, wouldn't it? But these are just statistics. Can you make an investment decision from this information? It's just market knowledge. There's nothing wrong. This is what I call observable information. It's not actionable. So let's, uh, let's play a game. First of all, I'll promise you it's a fair game. It's ten dollars to play. You can play as many times as you want. If you win, you'll get one million dollars. I should say pounds. Sorry. Uh, and the honest mathematical odds of winning are one time out of six, and so there are no tricks. How many want to play? Some of you know you're being set up. Yeah. It's Russian roulette. You know what Russian roulette is? Absolutely. Six shooter. How many want to play now? What happened? I changed your focus from the statistics to the risk of playing the game. And when you found out what the risk was, you didn't want part of it. You need to do that with the stock market. Always understand the risk of what you're doing. Is it not this, uh, this, uh, the same chart with the time that you showed about Dow, which you said that, <clears throat> that the average time was 4%, 4 it was making new highs? And, and, uh, and this chart is, uh, is also about time, right, in terms of 66? Yes, so just, these are just annual returns, the other are daily price movements. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure this is working now. the old-fashioned I think. Uh, 
Side of a th plus and minus three sigma band. In other words, rare, rare events. Once every 500 days, about, if you look at the math. And you can see that, my gosh, what is that, 1934? There were 270 days on a rolling basis of that five year period. And you can see that we were outside plus and minus three sigma many times. <laughs> Modern statistics said. <coughs> there would be 1.7 events on that type of data. But that would make all the financial models wrong. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> very, very wrong. So there's different types of fundamental analysis. Uh, we all know fundamental analysis drives, drives everything. Uh, if you think about fundamental analysis, it's ratios and multiples. And almost all of these ratios and multiples have price as the numerator. Uh, 
uh, current ratio does, but most of them is price over earnings, price over dividends, price over book. So the advantage of technical analysis is just, you, it's, it's just the analysis of price. Price is what you're going to be buying. If you're talking about trends in the market, you're talking about price trends. Uh, breadth analysis is a derivative of price movements that's advances, declines, new highs, new lows, up and down, up and down volume. Relative strength analysis, small cap relative large cap, again, a derivative of price movements. So, so to me, the real advantage of technical analysis is it bridges this gap between doing the analysis and taking action. It's just the next step. So there are technical analysis identify trend changes early, maintain the investment signal until the way the evidence indicates the trend has reversed. I stole that from Martin Prang. I changed it around a little bit. He laughs. Um, it can be used two different ways. One is predictive. I have no problem with people who are on television making predictions about the market. You just won't catch me doing it. I don't think there's anybody that knows what the market's going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, or any time in the future. Now, that will make a prediction that has consequences when you're wrong. That's the difference. Um, but that's fine. There's newsletter writers, TV analysts, and, and people like newsletters that make predictions because that way they can blame the newsletter writer and the trade doesn't work. Excuse me. Uh, yes? I actually read your books and they're absolutely fantastic. Thank you said about not being able to predict, surely the use of your candlesticks will give you a relatively some sort of prediction short term of what that behavior of the market might be. That candlestick book was a giant research project. Uh, I had software. Erwin approached me and said, uh, you ought to consider writing a book on candlesticks. I said, I don't have time. They said they'd probably sell a lot of software. I said, send me a contract. <laughs> so that's, that's how it happened. Uh, it's, a, it's a great visual technique. Uh, I was very blunt in the book, if you recall, saying some of these don't work very well statistically. And I just did measurements out one, uh, one up through seven days to see how they performed statistically. Uh, I, I tell people today, I said, I don't trade with candlesticks, but I would, I, it's a great technique and I would always make sure I'm using them with something else. Never isolated, never by themselves. So, I guess sales of my book just went down. <laughs> Actually, that book sells like crazy. 24 years. That's really good. <coughs> so, Kenneth Arrow is, uh, he's still alive. He's in his 90s. He was a Nobel economist. And when, in World War II, he was assigned to the weather department. They didn't call it meteorology back then. He was assigned to the weather department, and then after two years, he was, he was tasked with making weather forecasts in all the various theaters around the world on a monthly basis. And he goes to his boss, his commanding officer, after two years, and he says, I'd like to be transferred out of here because none of these work. This is no different than a coin toss. And the commanding officer says, we know, that we, we know they don't work, but we need them for planning purposes. <laughs> <laughs> so then the other, the other way to use technical analysis, the way I use it is, I call it reactive. I measure what the market's doing, and then react accordingly. So as a trend follower, let me explain why I think markets do trend. If you're the buyer of a stock, you're the demand, the seller of the stock is the supply. It's a supply and demand relationship, very simple. When you buy that stock, though, you probably assume that the person who sold it to you has a complete disagreement about the future of that stock. Is that fair to say? And you only buy it because you think it's going to go up and you can sell it to someone else later at a higher price. Well, first of all, you don't have any idea who it is that bought it. And you don't know why they sold it. You don't know who it is that sold it to you, and you don't know why. They may have a completely different view on the future of that stock, but they also, he might have also had a huge gain, and you might be his greater fool. The problem is you don't know, and there's no way to find out. But did you agree upon, you did, do. the buyer and seller did agree upon something. Was it the earnings of the company? Was it the products, the management? What they agree upon? The price. Price alone. That's how that trade is settled, and that's how you're going to be taxed and determine whether you made a profit or a loss when it's all over. 
So price is an instantaneous view of supply and demand. It's a fabulous mechanism. And it's only the people that are trading that stock that count. Now, they may be influenced by newsletter writers and, and uh, the cartoon, I'm sorry, CNBC. Uh, they may be influenced by that, but it's only the people putting real money, buying and selling that stock out that count. So keep that in mind. Instantaneous view of supply and demand. So here's a test. This is rhetorical. Here's a chart. I've taken the dates off, uh, the prices off, the name of it. So first question, is this a stock? Is this a commodity or is it a market index? Index. And you can't tell. You're just guessing. <laughs> I mean, I know what you think it looks like. <laughs> you, you, really, you wouldn't put money on it, would you? Say, uh, no guessing, okay? It, it depends how much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, is this a daily chart, a 30-minute chart, or a monthly chart? You can't tell that. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a daily stock. Some more questions. During this period of time, there were 24 earnings announcements. Can you show me where one of them was? And if you could, could you tell me where the earnings can be <coughs> good or bad? No. There were 15 FOMC announcements during this period of time. Could you show me where they occurred? And was, it the, was the report considered positive or negative? You can't do it. There was a hurricane during this. Can you show me where it was? All that stuff is noise. That's the point I'm trying to make. That is just noise. When you go back in time, that stuff is filtered out by the trends of the market. So, I'll tell you what I see when I see this. I see two good uptrends. And if I had a strategy that could be a trend follower and I could participate in most of those uptrends, I think I'd be pretty happy. I also see two big downtrends. If I was long only and I had a strategy to put me in cash for 70 or 80 percent of those downturns, I think over time I'd do a lot better than the buy and hold strategy. So we use technical analysis. We believe in it. We can rely upon it. Has anyone here made an investment decision using emotions? I have a master's degree in making emotions. That's the money I spent. Uh, Terrible way to make investments. Individuals who cannot master their emotions are ill-suited to profit from the investment process. That's Ben Graham, the great value investor. So keep your emotions out of the game. It keeps our perceptions clear. It ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And the most important thing I think technical analysis does, it instills discipline. A little story. I've been on a diet my entire adult life. Uh, I was up in the mountains with my wife a couple years ago and we stopped at an old filling station, a gas station, to buy gas and I couldn't pay for it at the pump. I had to go inside to pay for it. It was one of those old pumps. And I buy myself a candy bar. And I come back out of the car. I knew she didn't want one. And I get this look. And I get in the car and she says, you just don't have any discipline. <laughs> and I said, that's not true. You don't know how many of these I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I, tell, I tell that story because discipline is not a knob or a lever. You can't get up in the morning and say, I think I'll be disciplined today. Or I'll be 50%. Uh -uh. You're either disciplined or you're not. And I, I, would, I would say this. If, if you're a trader or an investor and you're using technical analysis, you should strive to be disciplined because it will make a lot of that stuff a lot easier. I, I put this in here, uh, periods of distribution, I call it past market tops. Most people don't realize how volatile market tops can be. I just randomly selected the, the top. With perfect hindsight, I know that was the top, right? You don't know it's the top until some time later. 
But I wanted to show the volatility of nine months before and nine months after. Tops are they're almost impossible to find, to identify until, until later. So I just show this for educational purposes. It went, eventually went down 50% uh, here. And then this is the 07 top. Again, we didn't know it was the top until considerably later. Depend, it depends on your time frame for analysis too. And so it went down 57%. Uh, risk and uncertainty. Modern finance, capital asset pricing model, um, modern portfolio theory, random walk, efficient market <coughs> hypothesis, option pricing theory. These all deal with risk, don't they? I mean, they're, they're great theories. I mean, well, there's more theories. They're great analysis, and they. But what kind of risk is it they deal with? They deal with non-systematic risk, in other words, known as diversifiable risk, and they do a beautiful job of dealing with that. The problem is, non-systematic risk is a fairly small piece of the risk pie. There's another piece of the risk pie called systematic risk or market risk, or I could call it bear markets and drawdown, and that's what technical analysis deals with, is the systematic risk. That's why I think technical analysis is heads and shoulders, that's supposed to be funny, over, over the, the others. It's just, it deals with the big piece of the risk buy instead of the little non-systematic piece. So all the financial theories and all the fundamental analysis in the world will never be any better than what the trend in the market will allow. I don't know if you can read that. So <coughs> one single thought that sustains me is that the fundamentals are still good. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if it was in the UK or not, but there was a show back in the 70s and 80s with Louis Rukeyser called Wall Street Week. Did you ever hear? Well, they had, they had people on there on Friday nights, and they were usually Wall Street fundamental analysts on there. And the market had been down 20% in the last three months, and boy, they'd, just, they'd be licking their lips and saying, the fundamentals are just getting better and better. And I thought, well, of course they are. It's price over earnings. Prices can plumb slowly, and earnings are only reported quarterly. I mean, the fundamentals are going to get really good. I used to never tell that story because it implies that I, also, I was home on Friday nights. <laughs> uh, I kind of stick this in there. I, I have a big section on secular markets. I uh, worked with Ed Easterling wrote some great books on secular markets. Uh, use, a lot of them use, this is the, he's with Crestmont, and then there's the uh, Robert Schiller 10-year average PE. Uh, I've, I've read pro and con arguments about it. It, it doesn't really matter, but we, we, we have a level of valuations now in, in the U.S. market that, that are exceptionally high and have stayed there for a long time. Now, you can't, that's observable information. If you were making trading decisions off of this, you'd have been out since, what, 95 or something like that? So it just doesn't work. It's just observable information. So I'll talk a little bit about this rules-based model that I created. Uh, that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> There's three components, very important components. I equate it to a camp stool, three-legged camp stool most stable stool you can have on the ground today. One is the weight of the evidence, measurement of what the market's doing. In other words, a number of technical indicators, price, breadth, and relative strength, is the market going up or not? That's what I want to know. And in, in the US, I use the NASDAQ composite for my market. I want a high beta index for my market. I want it to go up the most, I want it to go down the most. So we're measuring what the market is doing. We need to know where the overall market is going. Then, I have a set of rules and guidelines that tells me how to trade that information. In other words, when do we buy, how much do we buy, what's our equity exposure, our asset commitment, what our stops are, et cetera, et cetera. And then, guess what? The discipline to do it, day in and day out. When we get a stop hit, we don't have an investment committee meeting to see whether to follow it or not. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, and I hear people do it all the time. 
oh, should I follow my stuff? What, why did you set it the first place? <laughs> anyway, don't give it to one. So three leg. This is a this is a digital representation of an analog indicator. That's an analog <coughs> price price indicator. Anytime it's above that zero line, it's considered the positive trend. Once it's below there, and this is just a rectified way, just a digital digital picture of that analog. So that if you take the digital part and overlay it here, you can say, well, there's a good uptrend, downtrend, uptrend, and I call that not an uptrend. So you can say this this price based measurement <coughs> does a a reasonable job of identifying the major trends in, in this market. This is the history going back to wherever that is, and you can see how confusing this is when you look at the digital version. Because I don't, I don't care what's do, jiggling around up here and below the line. I want, I want the signals. And so you can see when it's down here, it means it's in downtrend. When it's up there, it's in an uptrend. Too much data on the screen. Sorry, but here, here's a shorter term picture. Does it work all the time? Oh, there's a whipsaw. There's a whipsaw. No, it doesn't work all the time. That's why I use more than one indicator. I have nine of them in the, in the weight of the measurement. I just want to show you how, how they work. Then I go in and, and do a lot of looking at various parameters. In that particular one, we use zero as the crossing line. I look at plus and minus values over this time. And in this example, I've got 30 years of data here, but I, I do this over various time frames, over bull markets, bear markets, sideways markets, random markets, des decades, I, I do it all, and I want to see robustness throughout. And then you look at all these various measurements and compare them to the buy and hold standard strategies. Uh, max drawdown, let me talk about that a second. Uh, I, you, first of all, you've got to remember it is a one-time isolated event. Max drawdown is the most that the, the stock or the index or your portfolio has gone from its highest point down to its lowest point. Which is like a bear market going down 57%. Uh, if, I, if I were looking at two mutual funds that had 20 years of data, one mutual fund had a max drawdown of 40% and the other had a max drawdown of 25%, which one would you choose? Well, with, if that's all the information you have, most people will say the 25% because that was the biggest loss of data. And that's, that's reasonable, except let me tell you why that's not good. You're looking at a, 20 years of data, you're looking at a one-time event. Would if that one that was down 25% on maximum had 15 or 20 others down 20, 22%? Or what if the one that was down 40%, all the other drawdowns were less than 10%? A little different picture, isn't it? So it, I like to use average drawdown. I've actually written some papers and sent them to academia and uh, got nothing in return. <laughs> you don't challenge the ivory tower. So this is a, we use, I use a lot of breadth indicators. Breadth is a wonderful, unweighted measurement of the market. This is 2007. Uh, let me explain why this works. Almost all market indices that you look at, uh, the FTSE, the NASDAQ, the Air Stock Exchange, the S&P, they're capitalization weighted. You all know what that means. It means that maybe the top 10% of the stocks just drive the whole index. The bottom 10 contribute nothing. And then the ones in the train. So it's all based on capitalization. Uh, Back in the, in the NASDAQ 100, I think the top 10 at one point accounted for 43% of the movement of the entire index. So as the market starts rolling over in a period of distribution, you don't know it's distribution until it's over, uh, a topping process, there's a tendency, I think, for investors and money managers, or just still investors, to, to seek a little bit of safety. And you do that by getting out of your small cap or your high beta stocks, whatever, and moving to what is perceived to be safer, large cap, blue chip stocks. It's a fairly normal process, whatever the reason. Well, what happens is that drives the market, the cap weighted market indices higher because everybody's going in. 1999, large cap growth was the only thing going up. 
Breadth, on the other hand, treats every stock equally. Exxon Mobil can be up $40 in one day, and Bubba's Pizza can be down a penny, and one's an advance and one's a decline, and they cancel each other out. That's the unweighted part of it. And what you'll see is, during periods of distribution, you'll see the breadth indicators deteriorate. In other words, the troops are not following the generals anymore. Tom McClellan says that breath arrives at the party on time, but it always leaves early. Now, this is kind of like some, some of those recession indicators. Breath will call a top. They'll call 15 of them out of the last seven tops. In other words, they, it happens a lot. And it, it doesn't have to be a big major top, but, but a lot of times breath will show weakness when, in fact, it's just a small correction in the market. So you have to be careful on how you use it. I don't hit myself. So, busy, busy slide. I want to go through this. This is the weight of the evidence indicators. There's some price-based indicators. There's relative strength. There's a lot of breadth-based indicators. There's a volatility-adjusted trend measure. And you, you see these little digital signals here? I, I could have left out these analog lines and just looked at the digitals, because that's all I'm interested in. Is the, is the advanced decline, this is not the advanced decline line, but is the advanced, is this breadth indicator, it's on a buy signal there, it's on a sell signal all the way there, there's a buy signal there. In other words, that's how it works. Each one of these has a point value assigned to it, so that if they were all saying, this is an uptrend, this is the total that goes from zero to 100. I did it so that when they're all on, it's at 100. When they're all off, it's zero, and they can be anything in between. So you can see it's 100 here, and it, as some of these start turning off, you can see it, the total weight of the evidence declines. So here, here's an example. Here's, uh, this is probably 2010, I think. Um, you can see we're 100% in cash, and some of the indicators start turning on. You can see there's the first one that turns on. That, that line, that digital signal popping on there is worth 10 points. It means that went from there to there up 10 points. <coughs> this is simple stuff. It looks very complex, but it's not. It's very simple. There's the next one turned on. Uh, that's probably worth 10 points. Popped it up again. And you can see they all come on at different times because some of them are faster than others, some are slower. And they're all measuring different things. And it, it doesn't mean they, two or three of them could come on at the same, at the same time. So all we're doing is taking the weight of the evidence, price, breadth, relative strength, and we're measuring it. And then this is that top plot, that blue line. This is the total weight of the evidence right here. It goes from 100 down to zero. And I can say, well, there it is at 55. There it is at 70. So I know exactly every day what the weight of the evidence is. So down here, I've divided between 30 and zero. And I call it the red zone. It means that only 30% or less of the technical indicators are saying we're in an uptrend. That's not very many. But when it starts turning on, we use the red zone. We have very tight stops. We have a very small amount of asset commitment because the risk is very high. Stops are unbelievably tight in the red zone. Why? I want to be right or I want to be out. I'm not trying to prove anything to the market. I know I'm going to be wrong sometimes, but I'm not going to leave money on the table. Then from 30 to 50, that means that 50% of the indicators are now saying we're in a trend. The stops get a little looser, the buying requirements get a little looser, and we start adding that with exposure. The rules tell us exactly how to do things at all times. These four zones have their own set of rules. Then when we get up into the green area, we've got 80% or more of our indicators are saying we're in an uptrend, our stops are looser, our buying requirements are looser. In other words, the universe of ETFs that we can buy opens up considerably. This is kind of a, a very difficult picture. We've been, this model's been in existence since 1996. These are the colors of that ETF. It's red, orange, yellow, green. Um, I did those colors before the TSA came up with theirs. 
Uh, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to say those bottom, the 50% and below the red and the orange, let's call that just red for that whole 50%. In other words, let's reduce it to two colors, red and green. 50% above is green. So it's a little easier to see. And I think if you look at that, you say, well, that does a pretty good job of showing up trends and downtrends, doesn't it? Is it right all the time? No. But it does a fairly decent job. Whenever it's green, you're generally in an uptrend. Whenever it's red, you're generally in a downtrend. And there's some whipsaws in there. And that's all I wanted to do. Here's a little shorter term picture, more up to date. Uh, there's a problem. That was probably a problem. That was all a problem. If you're striving for perfection in a technical model, you're, not, you're never going to get around to trade. You're going to spend all your time striving for perfection. What you have to do is have stops on everything you have, and then you can accept these imperfections in your model. Instead of trying to fix the imperfections, have rules to deal with. So, <clears throat> I don't have any captions for these with this. So, the, the approach is no predictions. No, no attempts to pick tops and bottoms. As a trend follower, we'll never get in at the bottom, we'll never get out at the top, it'll always be later. On April, uh, March 9th of, of uh, 07, no, March 9th of 09, it was, it was 13 days, it was over two weeks before our indicators even started clicking on before we even started doing assets. The market had been up considerably. It was, it was in April before we got fully invested. So it's slow. But it's risk adverse. <coughs> but there is not you know, there's not slow because there's just a month. So month is slow for you. March 2009 to April 2009. Uh, no, it's fine with me. That's how it's designed. I'm just saying most people, most technical analysts, want to be right sooner than later uh, because they don't take risk into the assessment problem. In other words. I could, I could speed this model up, but it would cause also a lot more whipsaws. So uh, how did you do in the 2008, 2009? 2008, we were down 4.5%. That was your maximum drawdown? Our maximum drawdown in 16 years has been 16%. Now, I'll stand right here and tell you that we underperform in bull markets too. You can't be defensive. And, and, and you, ought to, you ought to deal with clients who want the want the huge gains of the market, but then no losses and bears. And I said, you, you just, you're not real. Uh, so it's all about the ride, is what I try to show them. These are just some statistics on drawdowns, 10% uh, drawdowns. We've had two of them greater than 10%. Those are the, oh, there's S&P, Russell, and then there's NASDAQ and gold over there. You can see that there's been a lot of drawdowns. Uh, these are the bear markets. We've had none. We've had no drawdown over 20 percent. You can see that the others have. Uh, these are the number of months in a state of drawdown. Remember we were talking about the duration, the amount of time you stay in a state of drawdown? About 42 months total in the, uh, what, 18 years? 18 years, yeah. And then you see some of the others, my gosh, 160 months, that's 12, 13 years. And then these are max drawdowns. I, I don't mind talking about max drawdowns when I look good. But uh, you can see the max drawdown is 16% right there. And then there's the average drawdown. I, the average drawdown, I think, is much better picture <coughs> because it uses all of the data, not just the isolated event. And then this is, uh, I, tell, I show people this. These are all these various asset classes. And I said, we start here and we end up over here. And even if they all ended up right there, if they all ended up there, where, which ride would you rather take? Would you rather take this nice meandering ride like this, or you want to take one of these rides like this to get there? Because you don't know when you're going to need your money. I deal with a lot of people who are approaching retirement or retired, and they can't deal with this kind of type of volatility in the markets. If you're withdrawing from your account when you're retired, and you're minimally capitalized for retirement. This is the last bear market, October 07 to March 2013. The blue line is buy and hold. It took five and a half years to get back to where you were. 
The red line is withdrawing 6% annually adjusted for inflation on a quarterly basis. You're done. You're toast. Another bear market, you're done. This is if you're minimally capitalized. You're never going to recover because you're pulling money out all the time. Uh, these are our worst, our worst years compared to the market's worst years are completely unrelated. This shows how a defensive strategy, we, we don't have a benchmark. We're always <coughs> measured relative to the S&P 500 because that's what modern finance likes to do. It's what S&P 500 never goes to cash. We do. So this, this next, do we have time for some more? This is the obnoxious part. You sure? Yeah, go for it. Um, first of all, my friend Dr. Humphrey Lloyd says, don't ever speak in absolutes. Absolutely. Um, Humphrey met, did, created the MBI system, I think he wrote a book 25, 30 years ago. It's a great, great gentleman. Uh, Isaac Asimov was one of my favorite authors. He said, the people thought the earth was flat and they were wrong. The people thought the earth was spherical. They were also wrong. It's not spherical, it's an oblate spheroid. However, if you think that thinking the earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the earth is flat, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. What he's saying there is, is that this is not black and white. Technical analysis is not black and white. Uh, and there's all sorts of technical analysts, different approaches, et cetera. And so what I, what I want to do is I'm going to show you some things, that, and I've been all of them. I, I'm going to show you some things after 40 years that I challenge for me personally. And I'm going to tell you why, and then you can decide for yourself. I'm not, it's not me right and me wrong. Please understand that. So it, it is an art. Uh, I actually explained in my book there between art and science. Uh, science is like when you, you know the sea level on 10 degree, on 15 degree centigrade days, standard pressure and perfect laboratory conditions, water will boil 100 degrees centigrade. That, that's science because it'll do it time and time and time again. You need to bet your life on it. There's nothing about the market anyone's going to bet their life on. They might bet their career, but they won't bet their life. Uh, and so I, I, a lot of people do this. Uh, they'll say, well, that stochastics just doesn't work. Well, that, you could say that, but you, you, you need to also explain how you use stochastics and explain to me what data you used and why you said that. And maybe, maybe you don't know how to use it. So, so I don't like those broad statements about this doesn't work or that works. Even though I'm going to give some broad statements on some things that I don't like. So do not speak in absolutes. Uh, Fibonacci retracements, uh, a lot of people use these, uh, they're in all the software packages. Uh, if you took the Edson Gould speed lines, Fibonacci retracements and some GAN levels, use a 2.5% error plus or minus error, you've covered 54% of the data. The problem is, a lot, of the, a lot of times I see Fibonacci retracements being used with perfect hindsight. Look, it bounced off the 38.2% retracement line. But I didn't hear them from the top started rolling over. I didn't hear anybody say which one was going to bounce off the <coughs> So be careful with that stuff. Make sure you're not using hindsight for your analysis because you can't make money in hindsight. Here, here's an example. There's the Fibonacci retracements and adds some little speed lines, and then there's other types of retracement issues. So, Fibonacci. Uh, 1 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2 is an arithmetic sequence. Um, 14th century, was he a logician? I don't remember, Italian. He wrote to Libor Abaci or something like that. Uh, I tried to read it. it was, the translation was bad. I, I didn't stick with it. But, but it really is just an arithmetic sequence. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems I have with it is, is the numbers that make up the sequence. The 
some reason, they start at zero. And I don't know who, anybody have a history of math or engineering? I don't think we, they used zero in the 13th century. I don't think zero came along until later, but in, anyway, it doesn't matter. No. And, if, and he was also tasked with trying to determine the propagation of rabbits. Or anyway, that was one of the articles about on that. Well, I'll tell you what, if I was tasked with that, I'd probably at least start with two. So, uh, you can start with any number, minus 46, and expand it the same way, one plus square root of 502, and you do them up to you get four digit numbers, you divide the next to the last one by the last one, and guess what you're gonna get? You're gonna get 0.618 every time. It's because of the simple mathematical expression has nothing to do with the numbers that make up the Fibonacci series. Does that make sense? Yes, but it's always been said that the actual numbers that give you the ratios, the numbers are not that important. They're not, they have nothing to do with it. Somebody assigned those numbers. I don't know where it came from, but you can start with any number you want. In fact, a lot of times, uh, Okay, and then the other ratios are complements of each other. Sometimes the last number divided by the third to the last number. And I, I always tell people, I say, well, I, I, I like to start with 2 and 19. Uh, 19 is not a Fibonacci number per se. And I said, I expand that. 2 plus 19 is 21. 21 plus 19 is 40. And I take it on up to you get four digits and divide the last one by the, the next to the last one by the last one. Lo and behold, 0.618. And I say I use 2 because B is the second letter in the alphabet. And I use 19 because S is the 19th <laughs> And I usually lose a few people there. Uh, anyway, so, so be careful with that stuff. Try to understand this stuff. I mean, it, it'll work so much better for you if you have a good grasp of what it really is you're doing. What is that? It's head and shoulders. Uh, what is head and shoulders? It's a classical pattern, but what kind of pattern? Reversal. Reversal? Yes. What's it reversing? Train. Oh, but is this reversing any train? No. You're using it in isolation. There's no, you don't know, is the button is it doing this or is it doing this? Make sure when you're looking at classical chart patterns and candlestick patterns, their reversal patterns are doing what? They're reversing the preceding trend. A continuation pattern is continuing the preceding trend. So, there's a evening star pattern. Can you have can you have that pattern in a downtrend? That's a bearish reversal pattern. We're already in a bearish trend. What are you reversing in a bearish trend? It's just three days that look like that. But it has to be in an uptrend to become effective. Academia does a lot of math uh, studies on patterns, candlestick and classical, and they forget that key element. A reversal pattern has to reverse something. And that something is the trend. And, I, and of course, then the art form is how much trend you want. I personally want enough data in the uptrend that, that is there for the, like the head and shoulders pattern. I'd like at least a trend that, as much as the neckline to the head. That's just me. But have something. Don't use these patterns in isolation. Candle patterns, let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, I don't do much with them anymore. Uh, they were developed using daily prices. Uh, weekly, I, I get a lot of people say, well, you use them weekly, and I say, well, I don't, and, and I don't think you should either, but if, you, if they work for you, go for it. Uh, weekly, open, high, low, close. The open is Monday, the close is Friday. You know where the high and low is. They both could appear on Monday, or they both could appear on all three. Three prices could have been on Friday. It's a it's a total mismatch of data. And to use that in a candle 
Now, a candlestick chart is one thing. That's the visual plot of the data. <coughs> but the animal pattern analysis, you're wasting your time. And I hear all the time, well, I've seen it working. Okay. Uh, intraday. Again, charting data. Candlesticks is a great way to chart data. However, the Japanese believe there was a there was a very important element of time between the close of one day and the open of next. A lot of trading decisions, a lot of buy and sell decisions were being determined during that period of time. Intraday chart, 15 minute bar, close of one bar, the next tick's the open. Not a lot of time between ticks, is there? So be careful with it. Um, I see this a lot. Um, technical analysis <coughs> on a time series that does not trade. This is housing starts. Now, I see this a lot, and I'm saying I thought technical analysis was the analysis of the supply and demand of buy and sell decisions to try to determine support and resistance and trends, etc. I mean, you can yes, there's there's an uptrend, but that break in that trend line didn't. There's no buy and sell decisions here. This is just a chart of data. So be careful when you when you see that. Um, I, I just don't I don't think there's any value there. Okay, now on the charts, this is when this is when you take uh, say the year 1987 and overlay it on top of this year and show that well, we're getting really close to the 87 top and it's scary and you say boy that really is that really does look alike. And then I'll show you two, three other and That's observable. <coughs> there's, there's no action. You're not going to make a buy or sell decision when you see that, I don't think, are you? So let me, let me show you some mathematical problems with that. Um, first of all, there's, there's an example of it. Man, scary stuff. Here's two lines. Are these correlated or not? Uh, is it correlated? You know, perfectly correlated is one, inversely correlated is minus one, and not correlated is zero. So, are those perfectly? Are they? Is that close to being correlated? Yes. Yeah. If and I'm looking at an analog chart, and I say visually, that looks like it's yeah. correlated. Correlation is a mathematical property, not a visual property. I don't know where this visual correlation came into being, but it didn't exist in any math I ever took. Correlation in this is minus one. Those are inversely correlated. Obviously, that was set up to be the biggest, biggest example of tricking you. But here's the daily movements of that, those lines that you just saw. Completely inverse of each other. <coughs> so be careful with analog charts. I mean, they, they really, I've looked at them for years. Some guys use them a lot, but it's just observable information. And so, here's a trick. Is this negative correlated? Minus one? No, it's perfectly correlated for the same reason. Visual correlation. Correlation is mathematical, period. Uh, I, these, are, these are some thoughts I've had over, over trend lines. I, I use a lot of support and resistance lines. I only use horizontal support and resistance lines. In other words, price-based. And, and the reason I do is because price is what you buy and sell. And, and I just never could use angled trend lines very well. Uh, certainly not to make any buy or sell decisions. Maybe a, maybe a situation of awareness. We're, we're coming back down to this trend line for the third time, you know, maybe, you know, for that. But I, I never, never could work it into a strategy. And I, and I was thinking about my horizontal trend lines, and I think, like, this is 20, 15 years worth of data. I think that as time goes by and the anchoring with prices, that you can, you can almost expect that the, the breadth of this trend line is going to get bigger over time. I always say you should draw trend lines with a Crayola, not with an X-Acto pen or what. And so I was thinking that <coughs> instead of a straight trend line like this, it might be better to draw an expanding segment like that to show you this resistance area. 
which might happen into the future. That's just, just my thoughts, just want to share with you. So the technical analysis, single best way to control emotions. It helps you keep everything under control. And then you've got to do this. You've just got to grasp the fact it's not going to work every time. If you're, I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you're striving for perfection, you're never going to trade. You're going to spend the rest of your life striving for perfection, and you're never going to find it. You'll probably get in some type of circular loop, but you'll, you'll find yourself in trouble. Um, at least you're measuring something instead of guessing. And then everybody has their rules, so I said, well, I'll come up with mine. Uh, turn off the cartoon, I'm sorry, CNBC. <laughs> uh, Bill Griffith's been a personal friend of mine for 35 years. There's nothing on a financial television, I think, that will help you be a better investor. Uh, develop a simple process, one that you can explain to anybody. Create a security selection process based on, in other words, when I buy an ETF, I'm, I'm using momentum solely. I wanted to do this. I was on Fox Business one time. We, Liz, I got asked, uh, we, we own the technology ETF, and, and the person interviewing me said, I see you like technology. The dummy here says, not really. <coughs> and she said, well, you need to explain that. And I said, well, yeah. I said, if we own technology, if we own technology, it's, it's not because it's technology, it's because the technology ETF is going up. It's on an uptrend, and that's what I want to buy. If I own gold, it's not because I have an opinion on gold or inflation or anything like that, it's because gold is going up. That's the only reason I own anything. And so I don't think that was ever understood by the interviewers. Um, discipline. I'm going to be that that we've got to develop a process for discipline. I write things down. I have a set of rules written down. In fact, the, the 12 guys in the portfolio management department, those rules are in Bible. They know they can't challenge those rules. Uh, As a professional money manager, this is almost like a sales pitch. I said, if you find that you just can't get the discipline, find somebody that can. I've always said that if you develop a great <coughs> operating model, but you can't execute the buy and sells as they're supposed to, pay somebody to do it. And say, I'm paying you to do this explicitly, like I tell you to do it, or how you wrote it down. And don't be upset if you, if you don't have discipline, just be proud of the fact that you recognize it. Now don't confuse luck with skill. Listen to learn the market. The market is always correct. And then since I wanted nine things to do with everybody else says, read this one. <laughs> so that, that completes the presentation. I hope I didn't offend anybody. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Q and A as long as anybody wants. If you have any questions? Yes, sir. Can I ask you how you market your product, your funds to people you mentioned, uh, wealth managers, UBS guys, uh, probably fund of funds, etc. Um, how do you market your technical um, um, philosophy and methodology? Because it's the toughest part, which uh, uh, people don't, they either in denial or you get uh, angry and um, so how do you do it? Well, that, that I've been living and breathing now for 20 years. I call it selling technical analysis. And that, that first part that I showed you is part of that. Right. I talk about that Roger Ibbotson chart using the 85 years, where he says, all caps are up 12% a year annualized for 85 years. And I said, you don't have 85 years to invest in. It's a very poor piece of information. I mean, like, unless you're a giant tortoise or something. So you get it. I, I, do this because modern finance is locked into this, and all these advisors have believed all this modern finance marketing. I, I, I think academic finance sometimes is just the marketing arm for Wall Street. Uh, I'm very critical on them, I, I shouldn't be, but uh, 
Well, it should be. It, yeah, it's, it's it should be. Uh, but yeah, that selling technical analysis. I mean, you got like I, like I said, the first thirty minutes is pretty much what I use when I'm talking to advisors. Of course, after the compliance officer deals with it, it's toned down a little bit. Uh, but you don't want to get into numbers. You don't want to get into <coughs> complex stuff. You just, you just lose them, and then then they think you're blowing smoke in the face themselves. But yeah, I'm, I spend all my time in front of advisors. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you know much about the difference between the acceptance of TA in the U.S. compared to the U.K.? Do you have any any understanding of the differences? I really don't. I, I think. Uh, how, how popular is TA in say managing money in the U.S.? Oh, <laughs> it's not popular at all. It's not popular. No. Uh, there's more and more of it. There's a lot more tactical strategies being created uh, because it's, it's got it, because it has gotten popular. Uh, we we were the only one on the block for for a decade, and now there, we probably have five or six competitors. Uh, the next bear market will sort all that out for us. Uh, I can't wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll sort that out really quick. But I, I think there's a there's a window of technical analysts, and there's new people coming in for whatever reason of the bear market. Uh, they have, they're not happy with their advisor or whatever. They're coming in, and if they don't study, and they don't learn the, the crap very well, a few years later they go out the other door. And so I think that window expands just because of population. But I also think it expands and contracts a little bit based on bear markets and bull markets. That's just me guessing. I have no numbers on that. But it sounds good. Anybody else? Yeah, you mentioned earlier about momentum. You use momentum as a primary thing. Is there one, if you had to put your life on one particular indicator, of which one is your preferable one? Or do you use or do you use or we, we, we use a number of what, what we do, and I didn't have to come to it. We have what are called, when we're, when we're buying in our, our model set, we need to commit 20% to the market. We have all the ETFs ranked, and we have what's called mandatory measurements. There's four of them. They're all momentum based. They're just looking at two different time periods, and there's different ways of measuring momentum. Rate of change. I just want to say, is it higher today than it was six days ago? Is it higher today than it was 10 days? It's all one. And then we rank them by the, the absolute measurement. And those colors of the weight of the evidence, red, orange, yellow, green, those tell us what those mandatory measurements have to be before we can buy them. In other words, when it's red and we're, we want to commit assets, we have, when the rules call for assets, these have got to be stellar performers. And these are usually <coughs> terribly non-correlated with the market. Uh, we've gotten in GLD gold before because gold was doing well and, and the markets weren't. Uh, even though we were starting to get early indications. Then up in the green, everything is looser, the buying requirements are there. Then I've got about 12 what I call tiebreaker measurements. Uh, a couple of them are momentum, but they're, they're, they're to help, they're not mandatory, they just help us. When we need to buy two ETFs and there's 400 of them available that meet our mandatory, we need something else to determine what to buy. And we also go ahead and look at a chart. It's doing this. One of them that I really like is called, uh, Perry Kaufman created a long time ago, it's called the efficiency ratio. Uh, it is measuring how something gets from A to B. Here's an example. You have two funds, two ETFs, and over the last 30 days, they both went up exactly 4%. But one fund went up there like this, and the other fund got up there like this. Which one do you think we're going to buy? We're going to take that smoother, lower volatility ride instead of this highly volatile one. Just because we picked the 21 days or whatever it is for that point, Three days ago, it might have been a terrible performer. 
So I want a nice, comfortable ride in the process. And those are called tiebreakers. Um, look at, I have to look at volume. Uh, even though it's an ETF and there's creation and redemption process, that all comes at a cost. But I, and then we, have, we deal with the trading desk directly, Goldman, J.P. Morgan, all those. So we, uh, well, they make millions of dollars off of commissions with us. So they're, they're very intent on giving us very good executions. Um, so we, we can say, well, we sure like X, Y, Z, but we don't think it's very liquid. How do you think you, you, we can do this? And he'll look at it and, and let us and be very honest about it. So, did I answer your question? Yeah. 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 Do you have any compliance issues when you go into cash? Because uh, <coughs> uh, no, no, we have we have uh, we have some issues with some of the platforms that we try to get on because when we're in cash, we're still in equity. It's a mutual fund. Mutual fund is an equity. We just happen to be in cash. And so this really solves a lot of advisors' problems who want a defensive strategy, but the, I don't want to pick on any, Wells Fargo, whatever, says you can never go to cash and you have to have, you can only have 20% in fixed income. You know, they put these restrictions on these guys. Well, they can be in us, and if they put 30% in us, they're 30% equity. It doesn't matter what we are in. When we're in cash, they still own an equity mutual fund. So, but a lot of them, we're not on a lot of platforms because we go to cash. Because mainstream yep. finance is yep. cash. Yep. So. Anyway, this brings me to the first point you said about art, and you said that this is an art you're doing, and, and you know. So, and you also talked about the chart about about that in the market risk where there's a lot of part which is not a you know, uh, uh, non market market related risk. Do you think that we can reach a stage of tactical system based allocation where your skill set is challenged of picking selection? I, I think we probably reach a state where we think we can reach that kind of state. I, mar as long as markets are traded by buyers and sellers, I think it's going to be hard to do. Uh, there, there's a lot of things going on in the market that concern me. I get asked about high frequency trading and all this, and I say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And I'm sure I'm going to toss and turn all night worrying about something I have no control over. I can't see it in the chart. Looks like a regular old chart to me. I don't know if there's high frequency trading going on or not. The other thing about high frequency trading is, is, is everybody says, oh, they're bringing liquidity to the market. Well, they're only trading liquid instruments to start with. They're bringing more liquidity to something that's already liquid. So uh, I didn't really answer your question. That, that, that's a that's that's too far out there. I, I don't. Because, I don't. Because it is a <coughs> it's a it's a competition between indexing companies, smaller betas, betas getting redefined, betas going forward and explaining more alpha. So when beta started becoming bigger, then uh, the, uh, the whole technical analysis, stock selection also gets challenged because one, one side we say these, these like, you know, fundamentalists uh, do not know how they do their job and we claim that we chartists know how to do the job, but then they are indexing companies which are extending the definition of unexplained alpha. So if they get into that tactical part where cash becomes a system driven allocation, then beta gets extended. If beta gets extended, then what you are talking about is drawdown and you're talking about what you are benchmarking with, they, uh, there will be benchmarks which you can benchmark with. Yeah, there already are. Uh, I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know. That's, that's I'm going to be retired here in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's a... Uh, I think the market has a way of dealing with all that. Uh, as long as the market is dealt with fairly, which I think in the big picture of things it is, you can see insider trading and all this stuff that happens, but I think as long as it, we can think of it as a free market where buyers and sellers are, are agreeing on prices, I think it will correct a lot of that. A long-term cap capital, a bunch of uh, financial geniuses, Burton, I can't think of the other guys' names. 
going some more gin. Yeah, back in yeah the 1998, uh, gosh, the market was starting to roll over. Remember, 98, 99, the market was rolling over. I mean, our model had us in cash. It was it hurt because large cap growth was causing all the cap indices to rocket higher. Small cap, mid cap, everything else is going sideways and down. I mean, it, it, it was terrible. And uh, uh, they started tinkering with their model, their model which was created and used only in a bull market, looking for pricing inefficiencies. And uh, gosh, before long, they, they almost took the New York Fed out with they went <coughs> about $138 billion down to, they just lost it all in a matter of weeks. New York Fed stepped in and, and solved the potential <coughs> issues. So those types of things, when, when people think they're getting too smart for the markets, I, I think the market corrects all that every time. But like I said, I'm glad I retired. <laughs> yes, sir. No, 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 no Trevor. Trevor. Um, how, I, in your sort of binary sort of scoring method, um, as you see, say, um, market turning from down to up and, and things begin early and then later and later and later. Um, how much do you look at the, um, the effect over the whole market, the sectorial effect, you know, the, 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 the theme effect moving through all, all that data? We don't. No. Uh, our market is measuring the NASDAQ composite for price. And believe it or not, we use NASDAQ breadth. Uh, we used to use New York and NASDAQ, and we had a dominant indicator process that whenever NASDAQ was outperforming New York, we used NASDAQ breadth. When New York was outperforming, we used New York breadth. Uh, but when we, want, we want to follow markets to move. And the NASDAQ is a high beta index. It goes up more than everybody else, and it goes down more than it. So that, that's what I want. Uh, we, we have a relative strength measure which looks at the difference between small cap and large cap and Russell 2000, small and large. And then we have Russell 2000, the, the reason being the speculative process in the small caps is exaggerated. And so then we look at growth and value. I, I can stand up here and say small cap value, that, that sounds like an oxymoron to me, but, but I'm, I'm just looking at indicators. So. And then I use price versus breadth or only strength. And then we combine the three of them and say, anytime two of these are on, then the relative strength measure is on. Anytime two of them are off, then the relative strength measure is off. Kind of they're all three voting, if you will. But uh, yeah, you know, sector rotation is a phenomenal opportunity. I mean, it's, it's especially if you're gonna stay invested. Uh, you could throw cash in along with the 10 other S&P sectors. I think a lot of good sector rotation models out there. Especially good if you can watch them move in circles. Or, or in charts. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. I can ask you, I don't know how much you can go into details because of time, but when you go into buy mode and you're, you're in a green zone, and you essentially need to allocate capital to ETFs you're ranking. Um, how do you allocate capital in a sense that the moment green changes into red, correlation goes to one, and you're essentially taking um, a much bigger risk in red zone versus green zone because of correlation, so everything goes down. And uh, how do you deal with that? Part of your opening comment is my beer low level I just started to flash. So, you know. <laughs> uh, I think you're looking at a longer term process than we have. We look at the data on a daily basis. Uh, when, when, we're, when we're in the green zone, we're already fully invested. All we're doing in green is trading up. Every day we look at our holdings, we say, what's the worst performing holding we've got? And we say, is there something out in the ETF universe that we can buy to replace it with that is performing better? And if there isn't, sometimes if some holding isn't performing well, we'll actually sell it and just buy more of something we already own. Uh, there are stops on everything we own. Everything we own, I can tell you to the penny what the stop is. And when that price is hit, it is sold. There's no committee meetings. It's just sold. And 
Now, we normally, in green, which is saying the market's up, we won't see stops. That's what we should all, all trading out is the only way we should always be trading into better performing assets. But as the market starts to roll over, and we go from green to yellow, which means maybe one indicator dropped us down from green to yellow, the stops automatically tighten on every holding we have. And what we use for stops is a percentage from the highest high of the last 21 days. In other words, it, it's, it's a, not it's, technically stop. It's what? It's not technically stop. It is. It is. It is. It is. Well, it's no, using a percentage. Yeah, I'm using a percentage. I'm, in other words, it follows the stock up, but once it starts down, the stop doesn't change because it's based on the highest high in the last 21 days. Now, that works almost all the time, but if you were in a very slow decline, that, that highest high can come down too after 21 days. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you, <coughs> so we, have, we have a trend-based stop also as a backup. But, uh, yeah, the stops are in vital. Uh, I'll tell you what they are in green, they're 5%. Most, most people say, that's ridiculous. I said, look, we're trend followers. That we should be able to trade up all the time and get better positions. When they're in red, <coughs> are you ready for this? One and a quarter percent. Everybody says, that's ridiculous. I said, I want to be right or I want to be out. I'm not trying to play a game here. We have indications that the market is starting in an uptrend, and I want to participate in it if I can, but if I'm wrong, I want out so fast. <coughs> well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.